Tonight, a special Greater Boston kicking off our series of the only televised Massachusetts primary debates. First up, the race for attorney general, or as the position is often known, the people's lawyer. Joined by the three Democrats vying for the job ahead of primary election day, that's September 6th. Andrea Campbell, who represented Dorchester and Mattapan on the Boston City Council for six years, became the first black woman ever elected president of the council in 2018, ran for mayor of Boston last year. Quentin Palfrey is a former state prosecutor who most recently served as acting general counsel at the U.S. Department of Commerce under Joe Biden, and before that was the 2018 Democratic nominee for lieutenant governor. Shannon Liss Reardon, who built a career as a labor attorney going up against companies like Uber, Lyft, and Amazon, and challenged Senator Ed Markey for his seat in 2019. The rules? There are none. But time is short, so brevity is appreciated. It's actually required. Feel free to talk to each other, just not over each other. We've got a lot to cover, so let's get started. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank Starting you. with you, Andrea. Uh, you're a Democrat. The Democratic-led legislature went on a five-month uh, adjournment today, failing to act on tax cuts, some of which would have gone to renters and parents, rebates, which were targeted to middle and moderate income people, a housing initiative, and much more. What's your reaction to this five-month hiatus, again, decided by the Democrats when so much of the people's business was undone? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Sure. I've been crisscrossing the state since we launched this campaign, and, and what I know to be true is that people are struggling right now. Housing is a major concern, and I've been stressing all the ways an attorney general can actually help people stay in their homes. Of course, challenging landlords that are using all types of practices to try to push tenants out of their homes, potential foreclosure Should crisis. Should the legislature have stayed in their Beacon Hill home? Uh, oh, it, the work is urgent. It's right now. But what I want to focus on, because the topic tonight, of course, is the attorney general race, is really getting folks to pay attention to this race and to understand what that office can do to help them with the rising price of, uh, rising costs of things and, of course, with the housing crisis we're dealing well, with. Well, the legislature was trying to deal with the cost of things but failed to. Should they have stayed? Are you troubled by what they did? Absolutely. Our democracy is not working well on the national level. Our democracy is literally under attack. But our democracy doesn't work right here in Beacon Hill. And let me give you an example. Um, uh, the rebate that you're talking about, they excluded people <clears throat> under $38,000 a year. Um, but then when there was uh, an amendment to try to include people who needed that relief the most, uh, there was just a voice vote. Uh, and therefore, the people of Massachusetts couldn't know how their representatives vote. We need a democracy that's more transparent um, and where people can be held accountable for their votes. Are you troubled by all the undone business? They could have decided to stay here longer should they have chosen <clears throat> There's a lot that needs to be done, um, and I look forward as Attorney General to working actively with the legislature to make sure we get the laws passed that we need to. As a practicing lawyer for the last 23 years, I know how important it is that we get the right laws on the books, and then laws don't enforce themselves. We need a seasoned attorney who knows how to enforce those laws. I look forward to working in partnership with our legislature you to get that done. you troubled that they're on a five-month break? Well, I think there's a lot of work that's going to be done over the next few months. I, I would have liked to see more get done uh, in the early morning hours, but I know a lot happens in the last minute. Quinn, another matter that was not resolved was Governor Baker's effort to expand dangerousness hearings beyond what they currently cover to things like human trafficking, sexual abuse of kids. And, and by the way, I should say dangerousness hearings, I assume people know, are pretrial detention without bail because of the seriousness of the crime for which you're charged. Most civil rights groups, civil liberties groups, oppose this change. Do you support it or not? No, look, I think we're criminalizing poverty. I think that there's too much pretrial detention. And I thought it was outrageous that Baker tried to tie the no-cost phone calls uh, provision uh, to that bill, that uh, measure. Um, so we ought to uh, make it easier for prisoners uh, to make phone calls. And tying that to the dangerousness bill, I thought, was a real, uh, real travesty. Senate Democrats actually voted to do it, do what Governor Baker wanted, but not in time. Which side are you on in this dangerousness thing? Um, yeah, I'm concerned about um, I'm concerned about Baker's amendment, and I hope the the legislature um, does the right thing on this. I know. Well, we're they did now. nothing. We're, which is we're the now right done for the session. Uh, yes. what, what about you? Should they have expanded the dangerousness hearings criteria? Well, I'll take it a step back. You know, the reason I'm running in a public servant in this race, I talk a lot about my twin brother Andre, who died while in the custody of the Department of Correction as a pretrial detainee because of inadequate health care when he was only 29. And so I think you have to strike a balance. Of course, you want to keep people who are indeed dangerous from 
harming people, from, of course, being released, going out on the streets. But at the same time, I think there's a question around bail reform. Some folks are sitting in prison, and we know that it affects poor people, people of color, disproportionately. And so I think it's, you need to couple both conversations. So should this have been expanded? This, uh, by the way, the attorney general today told us on the radio she supported this expansion. I heard her on the radio. Should it have been expanded or should it not have been expanded? I think there, I, I wouldn't have pushed for the expansion, but I, and I have to say this, of course, I heard her on the radio and I'm proud to have her endorsement in this race. I'd be remiss if I didn't say okay. that, but I think you have to be able to have the dangerousness process, but at the same time, push for true bail reform, which I fully support. You know, uh, I want to ask one more bully pulpit question. It's not formally within the jurisdiction of the attorney general, but it's a huge bully pulpit you, you're all looking for. One thing that allegedly bollocked up the legislature's work was the realization at the last minute that there was a law passed by the voters in 1986 that said when tax revenue comes in above a certain level, the excess, in this case, Baker says $3 billion, has got to be returned to the taxpayers. The Speaker of the House, Democratic Speaker of the House, said, well, maybe we shouldn't honor that. Maybe we should repeal it. Three choices. Honor the voters' will and return the $3 billion, amend the law in some fashion, or repeal it outright and spend the $3 billion on something else. Which is the right choice? Um, I think it's a little suspicious and a little fishy that this just got pulled out at the last minute. The legislature has been working really hard to come up with a budget, um, and I agree that middle-class households and poor families need a break, but I don't think we need to send $3 billion back to everybody. Uh, our public schools need help. Our public transportation needs help. So I... Um, so you would repeal, it's a law, you would repeal the law. It's a law that apparently no one remembered since 1986. So I think we should focus on what our needs are now and I don't think we should stick with a law that got passed for different reasons decades ago. How about you, Andrea? Uh, I know folks are struggling right now and, and most aren't even having a conversation, frankly, about this particular law. What they want to see is a sense of urgency and action, not only from the legislature, the governor and everyone, to put money actually in their pockets. They're concerned about the rising price of gas. They're concerned about the housing crisis. Everything you're talking about right now in terms of goods, prices are going up, including insulin. And so what will actually put money into their pockets? And I think this is a conversation you, you need to take on the road, which I think I get frustrated. Well, it's a law. Should the law be honored but, but, or should it not be honored? So maybe, I don't know, because this is, I, I agree with leading from a bottom-up approach. Ask the people. You're asking us, but ask the people. people what do they think? People spoke in 1986. They said by 1986, 50... okay, that was too far ago. How about far you, ago. Glenn? Too no, far we should repeal ago. the law, and we should invest in transportation, education, and building an economy that works for everyone. There's an orange line fire, there was an orange line train that was on fire. Somebody had to jump out of it. Our schools are dramatically underfunded. Where you live and the color of your skin shouldn't determine what kind of an education your kids get. We should turn. We should invest that money in building an economy and a society that's fair. I just, I, I just want to add one thing. I, we're not resource poor in Massachusetts. We have incredible resources. You look at the federal dollars that are coming in right mm -hmm. now into Massachusetts to solve for all of these infrastructure issues and these systemic issues. The question is, are we exercising the political leadership and with a sense of urgency to give residents what they need right now so they can come out of COVID, of course, thriving and prospering? Staying with you, Andrea, we've learned some differences in the last couple of minutes already here. What are the major one or two things briefly and specifically, not rhetorically, that set you apart from your two colleagues here? A few things. Uh, one is my personal narrative. I talk about having lost all of my parents. My biological parents are deceased. My biological grandparents, my twin brother dying in a prison uh, in the custody of a Department of Correction and saying, I have lived the very challenges that residents are experiencing right now and I will do everything in my power to make sure the Attorney General's office addresses those with a sense of urgency. And I will say the campaign we are running, it's people powered, it's grassroots. I've raised the most out of any candidate. My opponents are receiving either money from the state, in the case of Quentin. Shannon is self-funding in the millions, talking about spending $12 million. I'm out there earning the support of residents and really looking to be the people's attorney and, of course, to lead the people's law firm. So, uh, Quentin, tell me what sets you apart from these two, but feel free to respond to what Andre also said. So I'm proud to have the endorsement of the Democratic Party in this race. I'm proud to be a former assistant attorney general as the chief of the health care division in the AG office. I've worked directly in that office. I am not not taking special interest money. Andrea has been supported by a super PAC in the last year that's funded by Jim Walton, Bain Capital, Reed false. Hastings. We'll get to you in a second. I'm um, sorry. And, uh, and if you want the Attorney General to be able to stand up 
against the special interest. You need an attorney general who is not supported by special interest. What else sets you apart from these two? Well, I think that my values are where the Democratic Party is. I support Medicare for All, unlike Andrea Campbell. I support the cap on charter schools, unlike Andrea, on uh, safe injection sites, on rent control, on fair free housing. Uh, there are real differences in this race. What sets you apart from the two people to your right here, physically? <clears throat> this is a very important job leading hundreds of lawyers. It requires a seasoned attorney. I am widely known as one of the most effective lawyers in the country. I have spent more than 20 years fighting and winning for working people. I'm proud to have the endorsement of the Massachusetts AFL-CIO, more than 50 individual unions who collectively represent more than a half a million working people. I am the only one on this stage who has for decades used the law piece by piece to make people's lives better. And you know, there's some there's some states that require in order to be an attorney general, you have to have at least 10 years experience practicing law. If that was the law in Massachusetts, I'd be the only one on this stage. I am the only practicing lawyer in this race and I am the only one who has run a law firm. That is what we need for the leader, the next leader of the people's law firm. Quentin, I'll get to you in a second. Do you want to respond to what Quentin had to say about these PACs that Those are, are blatant you? lies and misinformation. How so? And, and there, Jim Walton, all of these people here naming are not funding anything in this race. I'm actually really proud to have raised the most money out of any candidate on this stage, over a million dollars, all from individuals. And I will say close to 95% of my money is coming from Massachusetts residents that are investing in me and my candidacy. That is not true for my opponents. And I will just add, that speaks to who I'll be accountable to, which is the people. I recently just put my tax pay, tax, recent tax uh, release, um, tax releases out. Tax, you know, federal tax. I know what out. you're talking and, about. And I'm so, why? Because on the trail, people are asking, where is the money coming from and what actually is actually uh, supporting these campaigns? I'm really proud that I've been transparent. I call on both of my opponents to release their tax returns, and I will continue to be accountable to the people. And frankly, building upon the leadership of Mora, who just endorsed me today, to continue to be, to be the people's lawyer and to represent the people's law firm with a sense of transparency and accountability. You should call Donald Trump on that tax thing. You wanted to respond to something, Shannon said. I, I will uh, not be calling Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did. So you've said a few times that, that you're the only practicing lawyer in this race. I've been a practicing lawyer for 20 years. Um, and being uh, an assistant attorney general is quite different from being a class action lawyer. Um, and, and, and the money that you're spending to fund this race, many of it, much of it has come from those class action lawsuits. And in some of those cases, a judge has uh, ordered you to reduce your fees. And I also that's, wonder that's actually, whether... That's not correct. I, I, actually, I, I also wonder whether, do you believe that assistant attorneys general are practicing lawyers? Because when you say that we're not practicing lawyers, you undermine the work that the office does as well as the work uh, that we've uh, done. That that, yeah, no, that's not correct. As we sit here today, I am the only one on this stage who is a practicing lawyer. Last time I checked, I'm the only one who currently has malpractice insurance, which is what you need in order to be a practicing lawyer. I have, I have more than 23 years experience fighting and winning for working people. I have won seven landmark appeals at the Massachusetts SJC. I'm the only one on the stage who has won jury trials, who has argued and won appeals that have put money back in people's pockets and made people's lives better. I am proud of the more than half a billion dollars I have recovered in stolen wages for working you. people. I want a jury trial once, too. Do you want to respond to that? Or no, no I, want, I want to respond to something that Quickly, Andrea please. said. Um, if you're not taking super PAC money, um, why haven't you signed the People's Pledge? Why did you put a red box up on your website? And what do you think about the conflicts of interest uh, that come from your recent contributions uh, from those people? So if Reed Hastings gave you $250,000 to a super PAC that was in support of your mayor's race, if you want to take on Netflix, um, you're going to be recused from those matters because of that recent support. Let's get a response. Uh, all of that is absurd. I'm talking about the attorney general race. That's what we're talking about. Raise the most out of any candidate on this stage over a million dollars from Massachusetts, mostly Massachusetts residents. The only organization that right now is supporting me in this race is Environmental League Action Fund. And I am proud to have their endorsement. And I think it's absolutely hypocritical. So will you sign the people's pledge? I think pledge? it's absolutely hypocritical that Quentin and Shannon, who both participated in that process, which was a daunting one, and did not earn their support, did not earn their support, I did, that now they're, of course, calling me out. At the end of the day, what people are focusing on is the fact that we have an opponent, Shannon, who's spending close to 
millions of dollars, but speaking about spending $12 million of her own money. I and what I'm it. doing is getting out there to earn the support of the voters and, of course, to ask them to invest in my candidacy. I'm not receiving money we from move the state. we got to move from campaign finance. And I'm not I'm receiving... Uh, I don't have millions to put in my own campaign. Quinn, if I can, uh, I think there would be agreement on the stage that racism infects much that surrounds us, from schools to policing to health care to the air that you breathe, depending on where you are. Some people believe that attorneys general can only deal with racism on a case-by-case -case basis. Some believe it can and must be dealt with systemically. If you believe in the latter, give me one concrete example of what you do as attorney general to systemically deal with problems of racism in our state. So absolutely, this is something that pervades all of our society, all of the work of the attorney general's office. I was the chief of the health care division in the AG office. I was the AG's representative on the racial disparities council in the health care sector. Uh, we have huge disparities in the health care se sector in terms of access to health care outcomes and population What do you do about health. as attorney general? Well, I think that you have have to stand up um, and take on those cases. You have to represent the, the, the people's interest in a number of the health policy responsibilities. This is one of the reasons why I'm such a strong believer in Medicare for All, which, which is a difference with Andrea, because I think that everyone There's has no access to health care as a human right. Do you support Medicare for All? So I think it's a national issue. I do not like to promise voters something we know we cannot deliver on. But he's you talking, support it is what he's, he's talking, saying you don't. Can I finish? Of course. He's talking about single payer. We're, that's not the issue in Massachusetts. We're nearly universally covered with 98% of folks covered. Right now, the question in health care is around quality of care. It's about cost. It's about accessibility. I will be an AG that sits at a national table with AGs across the country to push for single payer. Okay, I gotta hold right you. now, Let's... ask Vermont, it didn't work. I'm going to promise voters things I know I can actually deliver for Let's them. go back to racism. And if you believe it can be dealt mm -hmm. with systemically, tell us how. Yes, it can be. And I'm the only candidate on this stage who has been fighting fighting systemic racism throughout my career in the courts. I have been a civil rights lawyer. I have taken on cases, and I have won major victories. How about as attorney general? As, and, and that is what I'll do as attorney general. How? As I think, as I think more emphasis can be put on the civil rights division, and I think that we can approach uh, fighting discrimination on a systemic level. I've taken on the state for its discriminatory use of civil service exams. And based on my work, I got black and brown firefighters and police officers hired across Massachusetts. I've taken on Uber for its discriminatory practices, for its customer rating system, which um, disparately impacts black and brown drivers. Andre, That's the type of work that I'll do as attorney general. If systemic, and I assume the answer is yes, give us an example as attorney general as to what you do. I I'll just take a step back. As a person who sits in this gender and skin, I don't have the luxury not to take on racial disparities. I often get asked, what are the top three issues you address as AG? My opponents often list racial disparities as one of the three. That would be the norm. Everything the office would do, of course, would be a th through a racial equity lens, building on the leadership of Mora. But most importantly, that is the norm of what the office should be doing every single day, looking at all the systems in which racial disparities exist. I would prioritize prison reform, criminal legal reform, and really taking on uh, certain departments like the Department of Correction to make it more transparent Speak, and, accountable, and accountable. Speaking of prisons and racism, uh, uh, Sean Drumgold died recently, 14 years in prison. After that, it took him 12 years, almost as long as he was in prison, to get compensation. That's On this right. stage a few weeks ago, Sean Ellis, 22 years, Victor Rosario, 32 years, talked about how difficult it is to live even when you're freed after having been wrongly convicted. The reason it takes so long is because places like Boston, uh, like the Attorney General's office, stand in the way of quick compensation quickly. What do you do to change that, if anything? Not under my leadership. Urgency, absolutely. When I talk about criminal legal reform, this is one set of issues I would focus on. And you mentioned Sean. His mother lived in my district uh, when I was on the city council in Boston. And when she passed, we did a huge celebration to celebrate her along with her children. And so I know Sean and the family. This is an issue I would absolutely How prioritize. How would you expedite compensation for right people now, wrongly it's, it's convicted, so, almost so, all of whom are black so men? It's so bureaucratic. The process puts the onus on them. And I think we can change the pol policies, the practices, regulations to make sure that it's easier for them to get that compensation and justice. Quentin. 
That, that's, that's absolutely right. You need to have the AG office fighting, leading to, to free this money up. But look, the murder of George Floyd and the Kyle Rittenhouse verdict are just the most recent reminders that there are two justice systems in America. And we need to use the AG's office to move urgently towards more criminal justice reform, towards police accountability, particularly corruption and mismanagement in the state police, and more oversight of the corrections uh, system, uh, which is uh, deeply in need of reform. Could you expedite? Would you expedite compensation? Yeah, yes, absolutely. And again, I am the only candidate sitting here at this table who has the experience using the legal system to get money back in people's pockets, millions of dollars. And I've been in discussions with the ACLU for years about this very issue because people who've been wrongfully convicted deserve compensation and they deserve it right away. Um, the drug lab scandal is a perfect example of thousands of people who had their records marred for no, uh, and the, their records should be expunged. The ACLU has done a fabulous job getting people out of jail, but people should be compensated for what they have gotten on their records and for years of their lives that were taken away. And I would use the legal system to make sure that the AG's office is on the right side of the issues. issues. I've seen the AG's office hold up these kinds of issues. You know, you mentioned a climate endorsement before. All three of you have talked a lot about climate in this campaign, your websites, that kind of thing. Two specifics. There's a uh, what's called a peak power plant in Peabody, gas and diesel-fueled power plant in uh, Peabody. There's, of course, the Weymouth compressor, the gas compressor. What's your position on both these things? Fight it. And, and this has come up, of course, as we're crisscrossing the state. I did hear our AG, currently Mora, talking about it on the radio program. Whole tech has come up. I was just meeting with residents and business owners with respect to that issue. The constructive feedback I've gotten is Mora's done a great job. Balance the national response on climate. Take on the Exxon Mobiles and look at other bad actors in the context of PFAS, but also focus locally on making sure we're protecting people's air, their water, and, of course, their environments. Weymouth and Peabody. I mentioned in my convention speech, I am firmly against against them. Uh, I'm proud to have the endorsement of the Sierra Club and 350 Mass, and this is one of the main issues in our campaign. How about you, Shannon? Um, yes, we need to fight them. And again, I'm the only candidate up here who knows how to use the legal system to do that. I have taken on the biggest corporations in America, and I've won. Big polluters need to be held accountable. We've got some good laws here in Massachusetts to help fight climate change, but laws don't enforce themselves. We need a seasoned attorney who knows how to lead the people's law firm to get where we need to be on climate change. Another, sorry, I, I want to just push back, and I think Quentin started there, this suggestion that we don't have legal experience or background. All of us come with legal back, a legal background that is unique and distinct. And if, for example, I didn't have enough experience, Maury Healy would not have endorsed me in this race. Scott Hoshbarger would not have endorsed me in this race. Frank Bellotti, Jim Shannon, Martha Coakley, all of them are supporting my candidacy in this race because they know not only do I have the legislative background, but also the legal background. And this idea that we are not for the people, we are. Shannon and Quentin mentioned this earlier. There are troubling cases in which she has actually been her settlements, including in the context of Uber, been rejected. A federal judge said, I'm rejecting your settlement because it is not fair, it's not reasonable, it's not adequate. Why? Because she was going to get $25 million and the driver was going to get $100. I got to hold you there to try to balance out the time here. Do you want to respond to that, uh -huh. Shannon? Yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's absurd and it's a mischaracterization of what happened. I am proud of the hundreds of millions of dollars I've gotten back in the pockets of working people. Um, and I am very proud to have the support of unions that represent more than a half a million working people. We have a people-powered campaign. That is who I am beholden to. That is who I have spent my life fighting and winning for, and that's who's supporting this campaign. You know, I, if I may, I, I got to move ahead. We're very short on time here. Another issue you've all spoken about is housing, and we don't have the time to go through a full spectrum of things. Obviously, at the top of the list for a lot of people, including Mayor Wu, is what she calls rent stabilization, rent control. Not a statewide return, uh, but a local option rent control proposal. Individual communities could opt in, but the legislature would have to pass it. Where are you on that? Yes, yes, absolutely. Communities should be allowed to pass rent control. The cost of housing is skyrocketing. Families can't afford to pay their basic expenses or uh, housing. Uh, housing is and should be a human right, and it needs to be affordable, and people need to have the ability in their communities to decide if rent control is right for them. Quentin, how about you? I'm absolutely in favor of rent control. Rent is too high, but this is another reason why super PACs are so dangerous, because they are developers that have given money uh, to, under to the super PAC that supported Andrea last year, um, and that creates a conflict that makes it harder for her to take on those issues. It does Where are you on the rent control I'm issue? First, I'm accountable to the people, and I I always have been and have always led that way. 
on when it comes to rent control, rent stabilization, even safe injection sites. As an AG, I would not stand in the way of local municipalities that fought and pushed for those provisions or those things. Does that mean you support them or would, you wouldn't stand in the way of them? I, mean, I, would, not, I would not stand in the way of them but at all. But there are real differences if, in would, this race in not, terms of... Excuse me. I would not stand in the way of them. And I've been really crystal clear, like in my conversations with Somerville, they're looking at safe injection yes, sites. Are. Would not stand in the way of that AG. I would enforce those laws. The hold same thing with rent stabilization. Quick response. There are real differences in this race in terms of our answers to questions on safe injection sites, on single payer health care, on expanding charter schools, on rent control. This is not a race where we agree on the policy. This is a race where there respectfully are quite significant policy differences. Okay, we only have 30 seconds left for each of you. I think it was in 1996, Tom Menino, then mayor of Boston at his state of the city. I hope I got this right, said, if in four years the schools are not improved, mm. judge me harshly. What should we judge you as attorney general harshly on in four years if you haven't accomplished that goal, that one goal? What is it? Um, well, I have spent my career fighting and developing the law in favor of working people. I've held corporations accountable. Uh, there is a lot more that we can do from the AG's office to make sure that working people get every penny that they're owed and that they get it back right away. I plan to set up a fund so that working people who've had their wages stolen can get paid right away. So hold me accountable for whether I improve our collection and going after employers who, who skirt the rules and break our laws. Hold you. Judge you harshly on what in four we years need, if you're AG. We need to fight back against the Supreme Court on reproductive rights, on LGBTQ rights, on gun violence. We need to lead where Congress is failing to lead on the climate crisis, on guns, on racial injustice. And we need to defend our democracy, which is literally under attack. An armed mob stormed the Capitol to disrupt the peaceful transition of power. And the only place where we're going to rebuild our democracy is at the state level. Well, how do we judge you harshly on what in four years if you haven't accomplished your goal? Maybe making the office really accessible to folks, including as far as Berkshire County. We're talking about the people's lawyer, the people's law firm. That's exactly, I will absolutely be the people's lawyer. But there are many folks who don't have a clue what this office is. It's still described as a top cop. Really, truly rebranding it to be what Frank Bellotti coined it to be a long time ago, people's lawyer, people's law firm. Andrea and then, of course, criminal legal reform. Andrea Campbell, Quentin Palfrey, Thank Shannon you for having me. I really appreciate all three of you. Good luck to all three. Thank you. That's it for tonight. Once again, primary election day is Thursday, September 6th. It's a tough one right after Labor Day, so mark your calendar. Come back tomorrow for the next debate in our series. Democrats Tammy Gouveia, Eric Lesser, and Kim Driscoll will face off in the race for lieutenant governor on the Democratic side. And then next week, the Democratic candidates for state auditor will debate on Monday. The Democratic candidates for secretary of the Commonwealth next Wednesday. The Boston Globe, WCVB, and WBUR are also holding a series of primary radio debates starting this Wednesday. Try to make time for them all. For now, though, thanks for watching. Good night.